Today we will learn and reflect on the second and third rungs of the 30 rung ladder of divine ascent by St. John Climacus. One rung for each year Jesus lived among us. These rungs are entitled On Detachment and On Exile or Pilgrimage. To lead a truly godly and selfless life, we must first detach ourselves from selfishness and love of the things of this world. Our life must be an exile or pilgrimage from the things of this world where we seek to draw closer to God every day. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. St. John Climacus wrote The Ladder of Divine Ascent as a handbook for monks living the monastic life, cut off from the world in the isolation of the Egyptian desert monasteries, in a world before global communications where the monk could easily call his family on the monastery phone. In the first chapter, he has some advice for the layman who wishes to live the perfect life as best he can in the world. But the advice for his fellow monks must be allegorized to apply to our lives as laymen living in the world. Father John Mack has written a book reflecting on the Ladder of Divine Ascent, and he summarizes the teachings of St. John Climacus in this rung. We must detach ourselves from worldly concerns, from selfishness, and from the vanity that follows obedience. Father John Mack warns us against undue attachment to the values of the world. If we find ourselves becoming angry because others have taken or misused our things, then there is improper attachment. If we find ourselves becoming jealous or envious of others because of things they possess, then there is improper attachment. In short, whenever we want to do anything just to bring pleasure to ourselves, there is improper attachment. And if we read this spiritual classic carefully, we will observe that St. John Climacus desires that we be forever giving and forgiving, never expecting any gain from those around us. John Climacus begins his teachings on the second rung. The man who really loves the Lord, who has made a real effort to find the future kingdom, who is really pained by his sins, who is really mindful of eternal torment and judgment, who really lives in fear of his own departure, will not love, care, or worry about money, or possessions, or parents, or worldly glory, or friends, or brothers, or anything at all on earth. Nothing should come first before our Lord and our God, not things, not friends, not family, not father or mother. And St. John Climacus advises his brother monks to turn their backs on all of this when they enter the monastic life. And this admonition is very similar to the exhortation by Jesus in Matthew. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now what's interesting is that husband and wives are not on the list. Does this mean that Jesus never wants to ask whether a husband and wife love each other more than him? I don't recall anywhere in the scriptures where you're warned explicitly not to love your spouse more than God, although there are many, many passages saying that marriage is holy, that you should not forsake your marriage and marry another. Even Adam is not chastised for preferring his wife Eve's company. Marriage itself can be seen as a type of exile for mother and father where you start a new family. It's just as St. John Climacus warns the monks isolated in their desert monasteries not to look back on their life in the world, so Father Vasilius, another priest who has written a commentary on the latter, comments that he has heard too many young married men and women complain that they married too young, and they feel that they sacrificed experiences in their youth for the sake of their marriage and family. He warns them that they should not be tempted to look back. And we see this icon where the angels save Lot and his family from the destruction of Sodom with only the instructions that they should not look back on the sinful life they're leaving. But Lot's wife does look back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. St. John Climacus quotes the story of the rich young man, but to truly understand the story, we must read the immediate preceding verses. In these verses, Jesus blesses the little children. Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. And this leads into the rich young man who asks what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus exhorts him, you know the commandments. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the rich young man said to him, teacher, all these I've observed from my youth. And Jesus looking upon him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
in come, follow me. St. John Climacus adds to the story that the rich young man was made to become a beggar who receives alms for others, which completes his total detachment from the world. Father Mac teaches us that in addition to this detachment from selfish possessiveness, we also must be very careful not to become addicted to the praise of men. St. John Climacus describes it in this way. I have seen many different plants of virtues planted by them in the world, watered by vanity as if from an underground cesspool, made to shoot up by love of show, manured by praise. And this is the sin of the Pharisees, to love the praise of men, to become attached to the opinions of others. Father John Mack retells the story of St. Macarius, who was asked by a pilgrim on how he could find salvation. Our saint instructed the pilgrim to go to the cemetery and, and insult those who departed, and after that to return to the cemetery, this time praising those who departed. Our saint asked him how the dead responded, and then there was only silence. St. Macarius bid him, Go and do the same, and you will be saved. Be dead to both the praises and curses of men, and you will be saved. And the key passage in this chapter speaks of how we should seek detachment by the narrow way through the fasting of the body, but more importantly, through the fasting of the soul. And the short list is how we should fast our body. Let us pay close attention to ourselves so we're not deceived into thinking that we are following the straight and narrow way, when in fact we are keeping to the wide and broad way. The following will show you what the narrow way means, mortifications of the stomach, all night standing, water in moderations, short rations of bread. And I would like to add in the Orthodox tradition, fasting does not mean starving yourself, but rather eating moderately and watching what you eat. This is followed by a long list of how we can fast the soul. We follow the narrow way through the purifying drought of dishonor, sneers, derision, and insults. So how do we react when our loved ones treat us so? How can we regard their sneers or derisions or insults as if they were wine from heaven? St. John Climacus teaches us, By the cutting out of one's own will, patience and annoyances, and unmurmuring endurance of scorn and disregard of insults. If we are truly to love our neighbor as ourselves, we are not important. How can we begin to return the love of God? To love our neighbors as ourselves is to be as patient with them as God is with us. Thus, patience and annoyances is near the top of this list. How can we know that scorn and insults thrown at us by our neighbor were directed towards us? How can we know whether they were actually a reaction to cruel and heartless actions suffered by our neighbor deep in their past? How can we bring out the best in our neighbor if we return nastiness with nastiness? And St. John Climacus continues, We must adopt the habit when wronged by bearing it sturdily, when slandered of not being indignant, when humiliated not to be angry, when condemned to be humble. Blessed are those who follow this way, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is easy to hear a sermon on how we should forgive seven times seventy times, as Jesus exhorts us, until we actually try to forgive our loved ones who wrong us repeatedly. True detachment means that we would love God with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, now and forever unto ages of ages, so that at no moment will our thought of the temporal pleasures of this world crowd out our love for God, eternal and never-ending. Exile and pilgrimage are the third rung of the ladder of divine ascent. The word for exile in Koine Greek can be translated either as exile or pilgrimage. Although we cannot truly live a life of physical exile as did the monks in the ancient desert monasteries of Egypt, totally isolated from the world, we must live a life of spiritual exile from the enticements of the world. For St. John Climacus, this is exile from the familiar, from family and friends and things, and pilgrimage to monastic life in the desert a pilgrimage to a life lived not alone but filled with the love of God, worshiping God with the brothers of the monastery. For us laymen, it is exile from a life of selfish sinfulness, a pilgrimage to a life of servitude to our wives and husbands, children, co-workers, and all those whom we meet day to day. Do we follow the advice of St. John Climacus? Run from places of sin as from the plague, for when fruit is not present, we have no frequent desire to eat it. Those who feel they can dance and drink and troll on Saturday night and with good conscience attend divine liturgy on Sunday morning should consider the next bit of advice. Be on the lookout for this trick and while of the thieves, for they suggest to us that we need not separate ourselves from people in the world and maintain that we shall receive a great reward if we can look upon women and still remain continent. And here I am quite sure that if he lived today, St. John Climacus would also advise us to be wary of which movies we watch, what television shows we watch, and what books we read. One spiritual struggle we all face is the challenge, who is going to influence whom? Will we influence the world and our friends with our virtue and righteousness, or the world and our culture influence us? 
as St. John Climacus teaches us. Let him be your father who is able and willing to labor with you in bearing the burden of your sins, and your mother, contrition, which can cleanse you from impurity, and your brother, your comrade, who toils and fights side by side with you, and you're striving towards the heights. As the Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But is it only God's responsibility that we not be led into temptation? Indeed, not only should we exile ourselves from places of temptation, but we should also make a pilgrimage to places where there are few temptations. St. John Climacus teaches us, For our solitary life, let us choose places where there are fewer opportunities for comfort and ambition, but more for humility. Otherwise, we shall be fleeing in company with our passions. And St. John Climacus bids us to be humble, hide your noble birth, and do not glory in your distinction. St. John Climacus warns us not to be like those in the famous icon whom the demons succeed in pulling down from the ladder of divine ascent. And if you look closely, the demons even succeed in pulling down clerics. By much labor and effort, a good and stable character is developed in us. But what is achieved with great labor can be lost in a single moment, for evil conversation corrupts good habits. Father Vasilios teaches us that living a life of spiritual exile from the world, while in the world, requires balance. On one hand, when we live as an exile, as St. John Climacus urges us to remain unheralded, unpublicized, masked, and unseen, it is a striving to be humble, a wish for poverty, and a denial of vainglory. On the other hand, St. John Climacus warns us that exile requires discretion, since not every kind of exile is good if taken to extremes. I have heard Christians insist on concealing their gifts and talents for the sake of their humility. We must not be like the servant who buries their talents in the earth. The parting advice of St. John Climacus for the third rung of the ladder is to never give up. Persist, grab hold of the next rung of the ladder, climbing ever upwards. This is the third step, which is equal in number to the Trinity. He who has reached it, let him not look to the right nor to the left. And the Stoic philosopher Masonius Rufus also speaks of exile, which was a common punishment in ancient Greece and the ancient world. In Athens, each year an assembly of all voting males could vote to ostracize a leading citizen, sending him into exile from the city for a number of years, usually to a neighboring city-state. Often we may suffer exile of sorts when we are fired or laid off from a job or when we suffer the loneliness of divorce. Rufus asks us, how can exile be an obstacle to the acquisition of virtue when no one was ever hindered from the knowledge and practice of what is needful because of exile? And ahead we climb the fourth rung on obedience, which we will release in early 2023, then the fifth rung, the persistence of repentance, which we compare to the unrelenting campaign against Hitler where the Allies demand an unconditional surrender from the forces of evil. And there will be two videos before the rungs of the ladder where we will confront the sins and spiritual dangers of slander, talkativeness, and lying. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Both of these editions of the Ladder of Divine Ascent use the same translation, but each has its own thoughtful, lengthy introduction. And the introduction in the classics of the Western spirituality is by Bishop Callisto Swear. We find this work as easy to read as the works of the Stoic philosophers that influenced Christianity in the monastic tradition. But we also have the commentaries by Father John Mack and Father Vasilios, which are valuable because they reflect their experience as priests here in Confessions. Plus, some of the icons we use in some of our slides are from St. Demetrio's Greek Orthodox Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.